So about that pre-ramble, boy, um, we were talking about it before we started recording. Um, I tend to call these witch hunts, but you don't really see them that way. But, no, you know, just the whole well, idea with these celebrities just being called out for incidents right. that, they've, that they've done or that they've done, you know, years ago. I'm not saying right. that that's, that's, it's terrible, but it's just that literally every day is one after the next, after the next, after the next. It's kind of... Right. It's kind of crazy, well, kind of uh, ridiculous. I'll say it, 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 it kind of started, probably the first big person it started is, um, oh, before I mention that, I had to make the, the joke that I see on Twitter. <laughs> um, say, since Sue Hefner dead, he's like, yeah, that force will for every man. <laughs> wow. and, and, and now all of them get exposed. Yeah, um, uh, No, but it's just uh, two things, a couple problems. It's the, it's the Bill Cosby problem and it's a double problem. It's where, uh, you know, it's the, okay, so with Bill Cosby, there's an episode of Black Dynamite that covers it beautifully, where Bill Cosby is a person that is kind of in many ways the uh, kind of a, a lot of people see him as a great moral hypocrite in the sense that this was this was season two, right? I haven't seen yes, season two. Yes. Okay, well, season two. There's an episode about Bill Cosby that perfectly exemplifies why Bill Cosby was a problem. It's not just the sexual assault. Yes, the sexual assault was a problem. Nobody denied that, but it's, it's an added moral weight of it now, where he grandstanding and and basically proselytizing. You know, the idea of being a clean moral agent and how you're so good and how other black people. And the worst part is that he's burning out a lot of talent. Um, he burned out a lot of talent with uh, with respect to if he wasn't like the cleanest black person, you would uh, kind of get shut out in terms of your career. Now. And I can imagine because we just kind of destroyed a lot of people's careers simply because of his power and influence and you wasn't falling in line. Right. right? They cover that. And that's kind of basically what the episode was about. Like why Bill Cosby was a problem. Yes, the... The sexual assault stuff was a was an issue, but even if you know you can make the argument of shifting moral paradigms and what people consider an issue as opposed to now, all is fine. We could debate about that, but some things was wrong then is still wrong now. Even worse now, you could argue, but it's what people want to focus on. Right, and it's kind of the same thing with a lot of these. Right, most people, you say, look, you these people are supposed to be these great moral exemplars. No, all right, fine, but you know you have to kind of get tear up now. And in the, especially in the case of Kevin Spacey. And, and Weinstein, who used to constantly, from what I understand, constantly, you know, um, body itself around, yeah. uh, you know, muscle itself around in the industry. Weinstein in particular was like a known douchebag. So right. not only is it not, but a lot of people actually, I doubt a lot of people actually give a shit about the sexual harassment stuff. But they really care about the fact that, oh, we get an opportunity to take down Weinstein. We're going to use this. Uh, so it have a, I think a good chunk of people who, you know, apply in moral rage by proxy now. Right. Uh, not really moral rage on the own grounds of that they care about women or something like that. Uh, that is what I think. That is my two cents. Hmm. Um, and it applies to a lot of people. Louis C.K. kind of falls into that category because he's yeah, yeah, yeah. talk well, about... Quite recently, actually. Yeah. Well, not even that because we see it. We, we know a while back it was a problem. Like, this is... None of this is that new or interesting. Like, it's this big surprise. Oh, Louis C.K. is not a thirst, man. Like, yeah, we know because you see it in his comedies and we, it had many verifiable stories of it happening from before. It's just now people coming down on it. I right. think, and again, it times it with the idea of the movie that he's coming out with. Now, it's a movie I was actually excited to see. Oh, which what, what's is, the name of that movie? Um, love, I Love You, Daddy. Huh. Okay. And it's about Chloe Grace Moretz's character being a young daughter and it's about this man in Hollywood kind of looking after and Lucy K is her father trying to protect her. That's the premise. But it's like, yeah, this is a kind of... A lot of people, some people, someone went as far, I forget who said it, but someone went as far as calling it cinematic gaslighting. Um, if anyone knows what gaslighting is, is, is slow manipulation to undermine your, your perception of something. Right. And yeah, Louis C.K. kind of doing this weird kind of propaganda piece to make himself look good because he make a movie about this thing that realize that he himself is, you know, into that shit. Now. Yeah, in, um, in the get, forefront like, when, in when, it actually, when it actually boils down to what Louis C.K. do, yeah, it grows and I suppose you could probably sue him for it, but it's nowhere near as bad as what Weinstein and Kevin Spacey did, in my opinion. Yeah. Whatever. Point is, uh, it applying all across the board to, to everything. By the way, this really, I, I don't think I didn't mention this last time, it really recol- recolors um, Superman Returns, in my opinion. Eh? Right, I, I remember you, you mentioned it, you hinted at yeah. it, but you didn't go into detail about that. Right, because it, if you think about it now, it don't make real good sense that why um, this fellow Bannon Routes career, like, to take a sudden dive all of a sudden. Like, Superman Returns is a shit movie, in my opinion. But it was. It wasn't a movie that Make that I would expect make Baron and Routes career drop off a cliff like that. No? And I was right, wondering, wait, like, so, 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 seeing Kevin Spacey had to do with the fact that Baron and Routes career well, not pretty Kevin much, Space, but 
But here's the thing, Kevin Spacey and this fellow also get catching shit too. Um, the director. Oh, right, yes, uh, Brett Ratner, yes. Which, not Brett Ratner. No, not um, Brett Ratner. Not Brett uh, Ratner. Who's that guy again? Um, the other uh, guy. Who's that? Who's that? Brett, yeah, Brett Ratner get, yeah. get catching shit too. Yeah. But but Brett Ratner's scenario is a little more disgusting because it's like he out, he out that girl long before she she was uh, she was wanted to put herself out there. Though. Yeah, Ellen Page, uh, right. Right, and I was like, "Wow, that is he probably the most douchey thing you could do in a while, boy." Yeah, wow. But, but but on the subject of that, though, I love Gargado's response to that, where it's like, "I oh. will not do a Wonder Woman two if, yeah, if, she, if Brett Ratner is involved." Good, so uh, fuck yeah, that and, Rat Pack uh, shit. I don't want. Yeah, 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 exactly. Mm-hmm. And that's a, that's such a good call. Uh, um, and she has such muscle right now because yeah, out of all of the DCU movies, <laughs> she's the one who could actually say that shit. If one of what was. Yeah. If what over do shit that was terrible, she would she would uh, she would be in a position to say something like that because you know, like like I actually like the movie a little bit more now because Gargado had the gumption to see this, you know. Right. I love right. that, yeah. And we go we go find out that that's the sad part about it is is how far somebody willing to punish that behavior because here's the problem. Hollywood, almost everybody in Hollywood, like Rel in could get you can pull down pull up on some bullshit now. By far, like it's not even close. Like everybody ex- have no excuse now. And again, to me, anybody who clap for Roman Polanski need to shut the fuck up. But whatever, <laughs> right. whatever, whatever. Mo- we'll see moving on. And we, and you go see by the way when when it's time for some people who like really oh this person real convenient to be politically, but they go get catching shit. You go see the the, the shit that against that it's you when it's time to pull, burn everybody down in our forest. All right, cool. Um, Bill Clinton, right? <laughs> that <Yeah>. coming. <laughs> yeah. That coming. But we go find out. Yeah, but I don't know. It's, it's just it's just really, you know. It's like it's like um, what's the best way to describe it? It's like dominoes, basically, like a domino effect. Yeah, 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 yeah. Just one yeah. fall, and it's everybody else is going. Yeah. So like, I have not, no idea who's gonna get called out next. Though. No, like almost everybody who coming up is people I'm not fucking surprised at all when they actually think about it for two seconds. It's not that surprising. Um, the person that kind of surprised me was George Takei. Yeah, what, what uh, was what was the, what was that, the story that, around him again? I didn't... But that that was like again, it was the, it was such a long time ago, and I kind of makes sense, but it's still kind of gross, and I suppose yeah, that's how I still call him out for it. But um, well, it was apparently it was sexual some assault or something. Right, yeah, there's a male model, he grabby dick, I think, and that was pretty much it. I think so. That was pretty much, but he grabby dick. Wow. Yeah. Jeez. Yeah. All right. Yeah. That's what it is. But I don't know. Again, it probably have it probably deeper. And apparently, George is fighting against it, which is which is rare. It's not like what well, well, Kevin Spacey do that bullshit. Yeah. That, that which, which was which was so much bullshit. Eh? Because, because uh, in the case of Louis C.K., he kind of take his L and move on. It's like, mm. yeah, he take the L, he know he do. You know, you'll see if people think. And I, well, apparently, FX dropped his show, which was not that surprising, because the show could have end anyway, but whatever. Yeah. Um, but Kevin Spacey getting tear up is not, like, i not feeling any whole how about that. It's like, yeah, that had well, happened. All right, well, what, what I would say, though, is like, no offense, because I, I actually really enjoy House of Cards, though. Right. But I did not expect that Netflix would have been so hardcore. It would just be like, yeah. you know what, fuck you, we're done. No yep. season six, no season, no no final season of, right. of House of Cards. Yeah, we are done. Thing. We are done. Right, as, as I say, you know, I, no, but there's there's the real part. This is my last point, and then we can move on. The the whole point about it, as I say, you see how the same point with with um, all the money in the world with John Paul Getty and how he get replaced so quickly. Yeah, really and truly, is that look, Hollywood. Have a t- this is where the real moral problem is. is. Again, let's go back to Cosby. There's two pieces of outrage going on here. The first piece of outrage is this person up in a largely undeserved position of power. Only because of quote unquote career precedent. And because you do this weird moral thing, now you get to destroy him because he's not that much worth to you at this point. You couldn't have do this shit to Kevin Spacey 10 years ago. Right? He was bigger then. Now we kinda old and nobody give a fuck. And it have so many people with more talent and could bring more energy to Hollywood and, and, and show business than needing Kevin Spacey. It's, it's the rise and the fall of the utility monster. Right. But that's basically what all of this is. It's just a bunch of utility monsters. Between the point of diminishing return. If anybody knows what a utility monster is, it's a person who deserves more moral lenience than other people because they could bring things to the world, right? You see it with politicians and, mm-hmm. you know, as jo- make the joke with Joker. If you blow up a bus of soldiers, nobody care. But if you threaten one little mayor, everybody loses their mind. Yeah. It's kind of like that. That's basically the situation going on. And I have no problem seeing the world burn in this, in this context. Right. <laughs> Sorry Holly- to say it, but I like it. Seen Hollywood burn. Yeah, well, well like I, I like, no, but yeah. it's not really Hollywood dying because it has so much great talent that getting held back by these people right. in many ways. If you think about it, so sorry, the forest has to burn and you know make make way for the new brush underbrush to grow out now. And that's that's how I kind of seen this going on. I don't really care about these people because they're not that. Like I like if Kevin Spacey go away, 
don't really care. George Chakay is another one like that. Like, I, I kind of like him. Kind of. But he ain't have a career anymore. <laughs> like, who cares? No. Who gives a shit? You ain't notice it's not people he's, who have... He's now about parody now. It's like, hey, there's George Chakay making fun of himself because he's George Chakay, you know? That's well, he always, well, he always has a big running voice in, in liberal politics now, especially when it comes to LGBT rights and whatnot now. Right, and, yeah. Right, but says, but again, that's the problem now. You're using your old more your old celebrity status for that. And in the case of his case, like, all right, there's a kind of old scenario, whatever. He's a different person and not fighting a dog. But still, you could is the is the, sacri- the whole attitude of sacrifice is the good or the perfect now. Mm. And if a person wants to have that holier than all attitude, then you're gonna be judged by that holier than all attitude. And you had to you had to bust your own throat when push comes to sort of, right? Fall on your own sword when we're ready for it. And that is the problem. You know, that's the attitude of play. The, the left is fall for that mistake all the time, political leader. They, they, they want to create this perfect society, and then when time for to hit them with it, they can't, they can't keep up with their own standards now. You see, do the church all the time. Catholic church is another perfect example of that shit. Mm. You see that with pastors. Yes. Right? Pastors see that shit all the fucking time. Hey, anti gay this, anti gay that. And when they check the, when they check in the back, oh, I raped a boy when I was <laughs> last yeah, month. But, but this is, <laughs> like, this is, this is different. Come on. Right. Yeah. yeah it's like, fuck you. Yeah, they had to go down. Sorry. Uh, I, again, no real tears are shed for a lot of this because I really kind of think of, I can't really think of what celebrity that could really, I can't, I try to think of which celebrity could really go down that new, yeah, unless it's like a new celebrity who really coming up and doing something energetic, then all right, maybe. But all these old stars could fuck off. I don't really care. Because that's really what it is. Yeah? You notice it's a set of old stars. Yeah. Richard Dreyfuss. <laughs> yeah. Nobody give a fuck about your Richard Dreyfuss again. But, you know, it's men who just kind of been almost vampiric to the system at this point now. Mm-hmm. And Kevin Spacey was kind of one of those. Sorry to say it. I mean, he's a, a look, he's an actor I like. I like plenty of his movies. Like Seven. Like um, the other one with Brian Singer. Um, what do you call it? The first one with Brian Singer. Usual oh, suspects, by the way, both yeah. together again. What the fuck? Yeah, <laughs> like yeah. yeah. Anyway. Yeah, and that's what it is. I... <sighs> Whatever. I'm <laughs> moving on. Yeah, moving on. But... To yeah. me, I'll just keep my, my eyes open and just see what, what crazy shit happens between now and, and you know, till the, till the end of the year now. But, right. wow, this is going to make for a very interesting article, you know, like an end of the year article now, you know? Right. Yeah, yeah I, don't, I don't wait to it burn out. It burn itself out and see what happens. Um, as I said, as I said, if people serious about this, you will see some other names come up. Because it have, like, so much people who had old rumors long time. I was like, oh, you ain't get show up yet? I surprised Michael being your boss up yet. You Seriously. <laughs> I surprised. That, I really surprised. That, that would be interesting though if he if he gave me but, up but or something. Again, nothing fucking surprising if Michael Bigger call out on shit. But like in his case, you kinda know what you're getting, so you move on now. You know what you're getting with Michael Bay. So it's like, yeah, that no, no shit. Unless you're gonna actually carry him to court, he carry on keep moving on. <laughs> like of as, course, if, yeah. as if anybody give a shit. Stop watching the movies or, or not now. Yeah. Yeah, whatever. Next. Alright. Um another thing before I forget actually, um Eminem actually brought out uh, actually released sorry his um his first single uh two days ago it's called walk on water he actually released it on youtube um it was number one and trending right now on youtube but now it's number four um it features I, see people, I see people hitting it I, I, I well here's the thing like, i i listened to it um and you know like every time he's collaborated with like a, a singer it's always like a little automatic red flag when it comes to to true diehard eminem fans uh, like right. you know, the first one was with um, you know, with Rihanna, "Love the Way You Lie," and that kind of turned out well, you know, for the most part. But I would, I would admit, the first time I heard it, I just didn't care about it. Right. Maybe mainly because I couldn't relate it as much as all that, you know. But that's another story for another day. But then he started to do collabs with like Pink and Sia and you yeah. know other people, and you know, I'm all for him trying out new things. But you see. That's the thing. That's the reason why certain people or certain hip hop heads tend to dismiss Eminem now. You know, post uh, Marshall Matters LP because you know it's almost like he's going pop now. We have to have these kind of poppy crossover songs. You know what I mean? Yeah. The radio hits now. You know, and this one, Walk on Water, could kind of, cla- um, cla- you could kind of put put it in the same category. But this one was a little bit different. Here, um, basically the the idea behind the title walk of water is that um like as beyonce say um in the chorus is like i can walk on water but i'm not jesus i can walk on water but if the water freezes basically i'm only human and that pretty much sets up what the um song is about and just basically eminem just talking about well i have this standard that i have to maintain i want to be one of the greatest but I always have this self-doubt. I always feel like this this rhyme that I'm writing isn't good enough. 
or the, the fans might like it or they might like the song or I might listen to the full completed song and take his garbage and you know so it's all that kind of self doubt that he just brings to the surface here now and right. in the chorus where um, Beyonce is singing you hear um, basically like a pen or a marker being, you know, you hear the sound of like a marker like being written, um, like like words being written on a page basically with a pen or a marker. And then the paper would be crumbled up and thrown away. You know, it says keep doing that. It's right. And then the people will crumble up then, you know, like sonically that kind of sums up what the song is about, you know, just him kind of doubting himself and wanting to be the best. But, you know, at his age, I think he's like 46 right now. It's like, um, yeah. do you still you still really need to kind of outdo yourself, you know what I mean? Because, let's face it, we can, he could never go back to the glory days of the Slim Shady LP or the Marshall Matters LP or, you know, the Eminem show or to a certain extent, um, Encore, which some people say is probably his last great album, although to me that was like the beginning of the end, <laughs> you know, in terms of not so much his career, but just his um his relevance then in terms of rap music yeah. today. And I think that he is still relevant today. Um, not just as a white rapper, but also just being unafraid to speak his mind. But, you know, it's interesting to hear him talk about him still dealing with that self-doubt now. But I don't know. I just think personally, uh, for me, though, at this stage in your life, you kind of just had to say, fuck it, and just do what you had to do. If people like it, they like it. Because at the end of the day, I know he puts in 110%, or at least he knows he have to. You know, there have been songs and albums where, you know, fans felt that he didn't really put in that much effort. Like, um, what was that one? Relapse, for example. That was like the perfect example, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. That's terrible. Yeah. I have a couple of songs that I like, I'll go back to, but that, that's an album I really genuinely wouldn't get back into. Then you have right. Recovery, where he said in um, Not Afraid, where it's like, let's be honest, that last album was air. Eh, you know what I mean? Yeah. So I like, you know, that whole self-aware, this is, is, is good. You know, he's always been self-aware, even from the beginning, you know? Right. But about the song itself, it's this kind of piano ballad kind of thing. Um, it's slow. It has this kind of... I don't want to call it spoke a word, but almost like, you know, like Eminem's new style of rapper where it feels like he's talking. He's more freestyling than anything. It almost sounds like he's talking more than actually rapping. That kind of style that he does so well. Um, it works. It kind of feels a little sporadic at times where it's like, I kind of want to say something, but at the same time, I'm not, probably not saying enough. Or um, I've said this before in other songs over my career, so it's not really new. And then the odd thing, though, it kind of ends where the beat kind of changes a little bit, where he kind of reminds people that, hey, I wrote Stan, you know? And yeah, yeah Stan is still remains one of the greatest, I would say, songs ever composed in the 2000s period, right? So, but the way how the song ends, the, um, a lot of people who've been putting out these reaction videos on YouTube have been speculating, myself included, that this probably will lead into another song on the album whenever that album does come out. Or yes. this may be the, the, the opening track to the album and then you go into the rest of it. And if this is the case, like if this is like the actual opening song for it, I think that it is a great opener. Um, if I, do, I just take it like sequencing there. But if this is somewhere like, I don't know, in the middle or in the end, I don't think it'll work all that well. Um, but as a song as a whole, it's not that memorable. It's not the most epic song. It's not like, holy shit. You have them song. I have to listen to this again and again and again. I only listened to this once and I was like, alright, I I kinda get the point. Okay, moving right. along. But I do want to hear it in its context with the album though. And I'm not I don't know what the album's theme is about. I don't know well, the title by the way is called Revival, so I don't know if this means that we're gonna get a brand new Eminem or if this is gonna be the the final um Eminem album, God forbid, I don't know. But I would like to to really hear the song in the context of the album. But for now, I mean, it's it's all right if you you know. I mean, I, you check it out, but uh, it is what it is, man. You know, um, I know it has some people that do like it because it's that kind of poppy kind. Not so much poppy, but that kind of introspective Eminem, that sort of self-loading Eminem that some people don't really like. You know, they want that. You know, they want bars, now, You know, you know, want content. They want memorable lines, now. And I didn't really get any here. You know, to be honest, it it is just Eminem, just speaking from from inwards you know and yeah. that's all i really got from it but other than that though i won't say it's a waste of time but as a single though as and as your first single uh i don't know i i, I this is a, a kind of a dud in my opinion 
Um, right. But like I say, I, I can't really say that it's a terrible song. I just saying that as a first single, it doesn't work. Um, I don't even know if you're gonna get a video for it. If we do, I would be surprised. I wouldn't be excited to see it out there that much. Um, but I really would love to hear the album though, and I think we're supposed to be getting this um, sometime in this month in November. So I'll keep my fingers crossed. I hope that we don't have to wait too long for this. So I really would love to hear the full album, and then I can really judge and say, yeah, the song works on the album. But for now, kind of a mediocre single, you know, especially in terms of promoting your album, but. Hey, at least people, at least it's trending, people interested, people putting out re reactions and reviews it. So I guess that's the point, but yeah, I just can't wait for the full album. But for now, yeah, give it a listen, but I don't see you listening to it more than once. So that's just my opinion. Yeah. All right, so moving from music and controversies now to movies. So um, you saw Stronger? Yes. Yes. Um, like I said at the very beginning here, um, the only thing I saw was just, I think it was either a trailer or, t or a TV spot or whatever. Um, I know it's a biography. I know it stars Jake Gyllenhaal. Um, that's all I really know. So, you know, feel free to let me know. How was Stronger? How was it? Uh, it was pretty awesome, actually. Uh, right. So basically, it's uh, about, again, you're, you're right. It's about a true story. It's based off of um, a guy called Jeff Bauman. Right. And what it is is that Jeff Bauman is a dude who he basically yeah, so it's on that famous picture with the Boston bombing, Boston Marathon bombing that happened some years back, about I don't know 2013 I think. Right, which um, uh, which that movie that um, you were different to, but I I kind of like Patriots Day was um, Patriots Day, right? No, Patriots Day, Patriots Day. What are the okay? So this is kind of what Patriots Day kind of should have been in the sense that you didn't need to make up anything. Right, the story don't, don't is already compelling. Fictional compelled. character here. Exactly, that would kill Patriots Day. That is, it, it could have worked perfectly fine if it didn't have Mark um, Wahlberg in it. Yeah. Whatever. Trying, trying uh, to win an Oscar. <laughs> yeah. Whatever. But this was, this is that perfectly fine in terms of you're doing a solid story about something, something real that happened to the, this person. And it's about Jeff Bowman. He's the guy who got caught in the bomb. So it's this famous picture of this dude. They lifting up this dude and his legs completely missing. Right. Right. So it's that guy. So Jeff Bowman starts off the story. He normal, normal dude working in a think he's a meat packing plant or something like that. And he, um, it was a, uh, then he gets, he gets the day off and he's a kind of bum. He's talk shit, you know, not really doing much with his life. Um, he's, he's beautiful on and off, off again, on again, off again, girlfriend. Right. Um, played by, uh, Tatiana Mas Maslany. All right, but Miguel from, from Off and Black. Right, yeah. Off and Black, right. Yeah. So she, and she's pretty good in this. Of course, uh, not, not, not surprised. I, I, yeah, she, she's an excellent actor. Yeah. Right, and they, then they, um, so she, he's kind of don't do much, he's always late for everything, he never show up to anything, but he kind of want to get back with you, so he decided to, like, pass sign up, and then when she's going to finish the marathon, be there in time to, um, show the sign to show that he was there, but he was in the wrong place at the right time, sadly. Right, and right, I he does get he get caught in the in the blast and the story the story goes story basically starts there. Um so he loses legs. And basically what it does really good is just the idea of what the arc of what people people consider him a hero and he is very he's kind of always a cynical guy, but because he this happened to him, he like not seen himself as a hero because he's like, well he didn't do anything. Um, yeah. just survive. You know, he could have died. You know, that's kinda attitude. He's kinda cynical about the whole thing. But the mere act of surviving and going on in his life is inspirational to a lot of people and he himself you know couldn't really see that and he didn't want to do any shows because his mother wanted to do shows with him right um, he, he declined like the story go on with him declining oprah um and they get into some some decent uh moral stuff about guilt and survivor's guilt and uh, the idea of you know she was never really together with him all that much but because of this you could tell that she feeling guilty that she, she can't just leave him now yeah that kind of stuff and then they, the family not really taking care of him and they, they're relatively quiet about his internal suffering because he really going through, he really was traumatized by that thing and it's never addressed. They basically akin to post-traumatic stress disorder. That, that's never addressed. Yes, his physical therapy is one thing, but the psychological therapy is something they had to do now. And she was the only person kind of there for him. And they made it work. They made it work. Um, it's not really much to talk about because it just goes through that arc. Right. Uh, the end of the story gets to the, well, it gets to the point where he meets the guy who saved his life. And that guy tells him his story. And his story is somehow more darker than his story. 
um, his right. story is, is it related that. to the um, it's related to the bombing, right? No, oh. no, it's not related to the bomb. But his story was that what happens that his, he had two sons. One was a soldier. One died in Afghanistan, I think, and or Iraq or Afghanistan, I can't remember. And then the other one committed suicide because of that. And he was just there at the marathon, uh, just to be, just to support people and whatnot. No. And he ended up saving the guy's life. And he said, he said in many ways, he saved his life more than him because he had something to do and protect. No. Wow. Uh, yeah, 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 it real dark. Yeah, it, it real, it, yeah, it, it get real emotional and it work. And it's it, it, it the one big strength of the film is um Jake Gyllenhaal himself. Um, he's one of the few actors, even though he don't hit every movie out of his park. The movies he do do well, I really, really love. I mean, I still consider um Nightcrawler one of his best. Of course, yeah, yeah, most uh, definitely one of his best movies. Yeah, just like Enemy. Um, love it. Uh, yeah, he was even great in Nocturnal Animals, which I which I talked about right, last year. He's pretty good in that. Yeah. Um, but stuff, even even the, the bad stuff, I kind of liked him in, even though it wasn't all that good. Um, stuff like Life. Um, la- oh, yeah, life I still sucked, haven't right? seen Life. Yeah, yeah Life kind of sucked. Um, but, you know, or even... Um, well, Okja, he was kind of annoying, but <laughs> Okja right. was pretty good in as well. I know, for, good. For, for, yeah, for, for uh, me personally, he'll always be Donnie Darko. He, that is, right. that is but my one, all-time favorite one, performance. Right, the one strength of, of General Law, what General Law knows to do well is that even though he's a famous actor and whatnot, he, 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 he could convince you that he's that character. He's, you know, you don't think of him. You know, a lot of act, a, a lot of actors feel like that where they they they're doing the role, they're doing the role fine and they 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 say the lines fine and the acting fine. But because they have a certain type of face or they just can emote properly, the small little bullshit that's go through in your life now, that he 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 emoted that very very well. Mm-hmm. And the, the movie worked for the most part. It's not masterful filmmaking or anything like that. It's solid, competent filmmaking that tell a good arc. And you know, Jake Gyllenhaal's character comes at the end. He kind of accepts the fact that even though he's not a war hero or anything like that his mere survival is inspiration to other people and he started being more charitable towards people when they come up to him and that kind of stuff yeah. um and that's it uh movie was, it was just very very well done overall uh, for me i quick written but this was a quick one uh i get this one a very very high movie tongue all right that's uh, great yeah. yeah solid solid filmmaking in my opinion solid movie i enjoy it you know a little tears were shed here there it was good I enjoyed no, good you, you, you make a shitty man test. That, that's yeah, why yeah, you know, little, little, that's um, you know yeah. you should do this job. Yeah, I do a job. Yeah, it, it's very saccharine. Let's just be clear. It's very, very saccharine. It, it knows how to lay on the, the emotions and you get it to pour on the waterworks. But it work. Um, everybody had good char- characterization and chemistry. Um, Tatiana Masi- uh, Masiani playing Aaron Hurley. That's his the on and off, off again, on again girlfriend. Mm-hmm. Uh, that works. Um, this guy was in the movie and I, I was actually quite shocked. And he's, he's little small role is quite good. Um, my boy Clancy Brown. Right? Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, he goes in this. Well, I know him as. Uh, the only thing I know he has is Clancy Brown, right? <laughs> that is who I love him for. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Clancy Brown had a little role in this. He was great. A little tiny role, totally blind. It's like, wait, this, the only reason I know is Clancy Brown is because of the voice. <laughs> mm. uh, but yeah, you really, you really buy the Boston accent. I think that is a big part of it. The world building is very, very solid. Um, so all the Bostonian accents, from what I understand, is, is reasonably um, well done and quite accurate for the most part. Um, just how Boston life is, how Bostons think about it. Little small conversations over time and, and you know, how they'll think and operate in life. Great. Love it. Love this. Well done. All Solid. Right. Okay. Cool. Um, is, does this have, like, um, Oscar nominee written all over it? Um, possibly. Not sure. It could happen. Not, not, not out of the cards. Especially with all of this, um, <laughs> with all of this Ragnarok sh- shenanigans going on. No pun intended. Ah, um, yes. <laughs> all, all the Hollywood gods dying at once. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, sounds yeah. good though. I'll, I'll I'll make the effort to, to give this one a look. Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. Yeah. I recommend it. It's solid. All right. And speaking of films that you should give a look, well, I, I in my case with this movie here, definitely give a look because it actually lives up to the hype. I saw The Big Sick, okay. which is um well, it's touted as a romantic comedy, but I more see it as a comedy drama with some romantic elements in it um it's right. directed by michael showalter um okay. not too familiar with uh, with his films um it's written and it stars kumali nanjiani uh, forgive me if i got that name wrong um and basically um okay well just to jump into the story right so he's pretty much playing himself right so he is kumali in the movie and he is a stand-up comedian in uh, residing in chicago um, he and his three friends basically go to this um, this club and they perform there. And the owner, or at least the person who run the show, believe it or not, is somebody who I, I haven't seen in ages, David Allen Gregor. 
Okay, Dog like, himself. Holy well done. shit, he was in what? that movie. Yeah. Wow, boy. Wow, 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 wow. Um, and on the subject of stand up, um, another person that um, I remember, well, I noticed actually, she is currently in the roster for Saturday Night Live, um, AD Bryant. She's in the film as well. Right, right, right. Yeah, no, she's yeah. good. Yeah. Yeah, she's she, she's she's hilarious as well. Um, I, I love yes. her as well, right? Uh, so yeah, they they work at this club together, and pretty much his shtick just um basically involves his Pakistani heritage. He even has this one man show where he's talking about like where he was born and the stuff that you know Pakistanis went through historically, and you know just the the struggles that his parents went through and how they met up and all that kind of stuff. But he more bases it off of culture and religion as well. And religion is one of the, well, main themes of this film here. Because, um, I don't know if this is true for all Pakistani couple, uh, families now, but, um, his parents basically are trying to find, uh, a wife for him, basically. Trying to get him into arranged marriage. So, but the, the, the catch is, is that because they live, they, because they reside in Chicago, they're looking for Pakistani women who live within that area, or who live in the States, actually. So every once in a while, um, a, uh, well, a, a girl will come through and, you know, they would invite her over for dinner and then eventually they'll bring over the parents and stuff like that. And they are all, you know, really deep into their, their culture and all that stuff, well, into Islam, actually. But yeah. to Kamali, it's just like, no, this is just not for me. Um, even right down to praying as well, too. There's one scene where he's supposed to be praying, um, because, you know, they, well, you know, this is one moment in the day, I think it's like around evening time where you have to pray for like five minutes, I think it is. And, yeah, yeah. you know, he goes into the basement to supposedly pray. But what he does, he pulls out his smartphone and watches some YouTube videos for like five minutes or plays a video game and then comes back up and tells everyone, yeah, just finish praying, you know what I mean? So, right, um, right. right so one night while he's performing, um, he runs in, well, he actually meets a Caucasian woman. Her name is Zoe, uh, sorry, her name is Emily Gardner. She's played by Zoe Kazan. And, um, you know, our relationship sparks out of that. They become a couple. But then what happens is that um, she ends up becoming very, very sick, hence the title. And she has to be hos- hospitalized. And because of how bad, she, uh, how, how, how bad, how life-threatening her condition is, the doctors have no choice but to put her in this um, coma so they could, you know, do, you know, tests on her, basically. Um and this, of course, devastates Kumali because um, prior to that, they had this huge argument where she, um, where Emily finds out that, yeah, um, her, um, basically his parents have been trying to set him up with this, you know, with Pakistani woman and stuff like that. Uh, yeah, right. And this is her argument that happens, but, you know, right after that, mm-hmm. that's when she becomes hospitalized. Uh, so um, Kumali just really feeling bad about what's going on. He decides to, to stay with her, you know, to visit her in the hospital, check up on her, see how, how, how she's doing. So while that's going on, um, well, kind of fortunately, she, well, sorry, he ends up uh, meeting um, Emily's parents, um, Beth, who is played by Holly Hunter, and I was seeing yeah. this one time, Oscar-nominated performance here, I call it right now, Oscar-nominated performance here by Holly Hunter, and Terry Garner, who is played right. by none other than Ray Romano, who right. I haven't seen in a movie since, I don't know. Like, I thought that all he was just going to do for the rest of his life is do those shitty Ice Age movies, you know? So, it's the yeah, first no? time right. I've seen him in front of the camera in, like, years, you know what I mean? And, you know, it's basically the relationship between Kumali and um, and Emily's parents, you know, while she's still in a coma. And while all that's going on, he's trying to keep um, secret the fact to his um, family that, you know, yes, he does have technically a white girlfriend and... It does kind of come off. It does kind of come out into the open. Of course, the family don't like that. You know, they want him to be strict in terms of his, you know, religious beliefs and where he comes from and all that kind of jazz. So, and that's all I'll have to say about the big sick. So, okay. um, something that um, caught me completely by surprise is a shame I didn't know that until the very end where they they they, they actually show this. Um, this is kind of technically based on a true story, though. In a way, yeah, in a way, it's about the real life room uh, relationship between right. um, between um, Kumali and his wife Emily V. Gordon. Right. You know, okay, okay, Which, so it's well, very close. They, yeah, right. it's very very close. Uh, and like, right. when I saw that, though, that just that just that was like the icing on top of the cake for me because yeah, I did not expect to enjoy this movie so much, but I absolutely did. This is probably one of the best movies I have seen all year. And I'm not seeing this in terms of like everybody just 
because a lot of people have been rating this as one of the best like i've been looking at a lot of um best movies of the year lists and this seems to show up a lot and you know seeing it for myself no yeah boy i i really do understand why people love this thing so much um first of all the the the, the script for this the the screenplay the, the writing for this is so on point so well written for this like um I, i'm not expecting this to to be nominated for best original screenplay but i'd be happy if it did do it just it's so smart it's so fresh um it does juggle humor and you know irony and you know sadness a lot too because this is one thing i really love about the film it's not like you know um a lot from it film you know even though there are quite a, a large amount of um, humor and jokes in this but i was just more looking at this thing more like a a a, a, a dramedy in, in a way you know what i mean yeah where it's this really serious story but well, not serious but something so compelling uh, in an emotional way that you know yes there is humor but there there is that emotion that powerful emotion underneath though and that's what that's that's what pretty much latched on to me when i was watching this film like you know um like seeing kamali um on screen he reminded me a lot of um um you know um oh gosh that guy aziz ansali uh, sorry aziz right, from right, right. um yeah. from yeah. uh mass of none it actually reminded me a lot of mass of none this idea of this um you know this east indian person who is in the states and he pretty much get used to life there but you know on the one hand he doesn't want to follow everything that his family does he wants to chat his you know he wants to live his own life you know but he's always going to be kind of let down because of his heritage because of where he comes from now you know and i saw illu- um, allusions to that now basically in the, in in this film um yeah Kumali, I mean, I honestly haven't been followed. I, I honestly haven't followed up his work at all. Like, I knew that he was in Saturday Night Live quite recently, which is funny because they do make, they do reference Saturday Night Live there. Like, you know, this is a great, this is a great skit, man, or a great joke. One of these days, you should, you should actually definitely go up to, to Saturday Night Live, you know? And it's funny, you know, because, yeah, just the other day, he was on Saturday Night Live. So that was really yeah. cool. But yeah, boy, in terms of acting, he was excellent in this, though. Like, he yeah. had the comedic and the dramatic range as well now you know i thought he was just going to be like aziz where it's just like you're laughing at how funny he looks and how funny he talks but yeah there's some you know emotion underneath now, especially when that moment hits with her, uh with emily in the hospital now because to me at first like i was watching this thing i was like all right this is just going through the emotions it's a romant it's a it's a romantic drama with some comedy elements in it okay i'm getting it so why is it called the big sick again and then there's that moment where, you know, Emily's in the hospital and you really see how that affects Kumalina in his life, you know. That is when it really hit me, though. That's when the, the gut punches came in, too. Um, right. Because it's not just about the possibility that she would, that she may die, but also the fact that, you know, uh, with Kumali, because there's this, um, this subplot, basically, where he's trying to get to go to... Um, to this comedy competition basically it's a comedy competition that he's he's a part of basically now he's trying to win it or at least to 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 fly out basically to leave his home to 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 pursue his dreams but then you have the family dynamic where the family is like well no you can't do that you have to stay and be a doctor you have a real job you know what i mean and you can't be dating white women you have to find your own people you know all that kind of stuff you know and that kind of stuff really resonated with me as well you know and so I, 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 I connected on that film way more than I expected here. Um, right. Zoe Kazan, who plays um, Emily, I thought that she was fantastic as well. Um, she had a flaw. She had a neurosis as well. But, you know, which you, you, you could expect in, you know, in a romantic comedy like this, you know. This is, you know, like all from, from Annie Hall to now, you know, you always have these flawed characters trying to have a relationship. And even though they do have their, you know, their ups and downs, they do try to make it work. Sometimes it works out, sometimes it doesn't. And, you know, I was getting that. But, um, you know, it really did hit for me, like I said, when she ended up in that coma. But um, the moments where she is, where she wasn't in the coma, that's all I'll say. Um, I thought that her her, um, her acting was fantastic as well. Um, Holly Hunter. Um, she surprised me here because, like, honestly, I haven't seen her in a movie in a long while uh, to be yeah, honest yeah the last thing the last thing i remember in, in is well other than batman v superman yeah uh, all right there was there was that film oh, yeah. um, <laughs> she was in top of the lake where she was pretty good in that which i've been hearing a lot of but i yeah no, that's yeah. a solid series huh? yeah right um, oh, the ending will catch you <laughs> yeah yeah so good but yeah she gives what 
uh, I would say this in my honest opinion, uh, Oscar worthy performance here. I would okay. love her to be nominated here because basically she is like to describe a character, she is very much into um like today's technology now. So like when she's in the hospital, for example, or when she's at home, she's always on an iPad or she's always on a laptop now. And she always plays as if she's ignoring her husband, right? Like, you know, basically like Call him, call him out, sorry, to be weak and insignificant and all that kind of stuff. And later on, you understand why that's the case. And that's another gut punch there. Um, but here, though, is like, you know, she's trying to deal with the, with the problem. But she's not going at it like... Well, she kind of... she she uh, Right off the bat, she's very untrustworthy with uh, of certain people. So, what is her right. husband? Because of what happened before, it's Kumali himself. You know, she, she doesn't trust this guy. She doesn't know what he's about. And then also to um, the hospital as well. She doesn't like the fact that, you know, uh, her daughter is in this coma. She wants to move her daughter and put her in another hospital. There's this little subplot about that too. And then you have Ray Romano as well, who I thought was great as well. Um basically trying to deal with the situation as well but the way how his character is is that he's like he's he's the last person to to shout and you know get angry you know he's always yeah. trying to be rational try to take things easy yeah. right um and then because he's always gained so much um why because he's always being insulted basically I, i'm not talking about like you know cussing out a lot but just like um ignored basically by 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 um, by his wife basically um it, you know later on you kind of understand why that's the case and why um why he's the way he is but also to you understand why he puts up with it you know because spoiler alert he still loves his wife you know what i mean and that kind of rings this true message you know like even with the flaws even with the shit that goes on in a relationship even with the ups and downs like i said you know is just basically about that love that you have for your significant other and just holding on to it and really at the heart of the film that's what this movie was about uh, it was really about um kumali just holding on to what he believes in holding on to his beliefs um what it, in terms of like his life his his um his choice his choices in life basically but also the choice that he made in 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 being in love with emily even though there was that argument and you know there is a chance that either she will not make it or even if she does make it she probably would not accept him again you know what i mean and you know just right. just it's just that emotion underneath it all no, really really worked for me and yes it is comedic it is funny but it's not like gut busting laughter throughout there there are moments where it is pretty kind of um downcast it is pretty sad in my opinion not too sad of course but they don't it's not too 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 serious like you do feel the weight of the emotion but it's not as bad as it's not like a depressing watch you know what i mean there are moments where you will be laughing at it and you do drop some kind of ironic humor it has a kind of ironic there's this kind of ironic humor throughout the entirety of the film um right which is was which was kind of best um express in the stand-up comedy um sketches themselves um involving kumali you know because he's going out and he's pretty much kind of and i don't know maybe we could go into another talk about this just the whole idea behind stand-up you going in front of a stage and pretty much just kind of shitting up yourself talking about hey well r this thing that happened to me back then and you know this is why people don't like me or this is why this happened yeah, self, 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 self deprecation yeah that kind of thing that you know people are laughing at it but then in his case is people kind of chuckling it's like well why are they not laughing don't, don't they see me kind of pouring myself out there and embarrassing myself right, 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 technically right, right. that kind of thing though you know um and the funny thing is i mentioned that um it's actually well judd apatow is actually involved in this as well um okay. i think in terms of production apatow productions here so i know i was gonna get that kind of comedy drama vibe i know he has done it before but um yeah here i i thought that it worked excellently i thought that it was a great balance of comedy and drama but you do have that romantic element there it's not too much in the forefront and that was the one thing that i was like that i kind of was worried about like i thought this was going to be a full romance but then i was wondering well, where the big sick title came from and then right. you know when you when that whole coma thing happened i was, I was like oh okay now i get it. now i feel it cool. so um oh yes and and uh, um and before i forget also to um, the dialogue was was well written as well. Just everything about it was was so well done. The cinematography, the acting, you know, everything worked for me. Um, as for flaws, though, I would say that it just runs maybe like a little five ten minutes, a little too long. Like you you think it's gonna wrap up, but it kind of keeps going and going and going. But because I was just so captivated by by a majority of these characters, 
I I don't know, like for me, I just couldn't wait to see what happened next. It just it didn't feel like a chore watching this film. I just loved every moment of it. Um, even though I was kind of wondering how it was gonna end and when it was gonna end, but still because these characters are so relatable and kind of lovable, I was just like, yeah, I, I just love seeing these guys on screen, especially Kamali. So yeah, um, without a doubt, this is one of the best movies I have seen this year. One of the best comedies I would well. Comedy, drama, romance films, technically, I've seen this year. Um, right. I'm not sure if it's going to be in my top 10. This will be in my top 17 for sure, definitely. Um, I do see a lot of people putting it, you know, you know, really praising this film by year's end. Um, I would strongly recommend that you do check this out. Um, oh, yes, and in terms of rating, I would give this a uh, strong four to five stars. This is definitely worth checking out, though. Um, especially if you just want to change a pace from the whole big Hollywood blockbuster thing because um, yeah this is actually an independent film um, Amazon Studios actually brought it out well Lionsgate helped out as well um, right. and believe it or not the budget for this movie was like 5 million and now right. it grows like about 53 million worldwide so it is one of the highest grossing independent films of this year which is pretty amazing you know what I mean and this is just really due to just such a talented cast and a talented crew as well and just such a, sub a superb well-written script so yeah strong four to five for me the big sick is what the is it does live up to the hype it is one of the best movies i have seen this year so definitely 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 check out the big sick cool i should have seen this and make the effort but now nah, i'll go and take the time yeah I, 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 so actually it. actually i imagine you are gonna really enjoy this movie there's no way nice. that you could heat on this show. I, I just say i just nice. say nice all right, so moving along now to some action flicks now. So we're moving away from the comedy a bit. Now we're going to get into some action. Now we're going to get, well, first off, we're going to start off with some, um, well, what we call down here, a kick-up. Even though technically <laughs> it's not exactly a martial arts film, it's not exactly a true biopic, but it is kind of in a way, you know, it's, it's kind of weird, really classifying this film here um so this one i'm talking about here is called boot of the dragon right um it's directed by george nolfi who directed a film that um, believe it or not i have yet to see i just kind of skipped out on it for some re weird reason the adjustment bureau oh yeah i saw that yeah. well yeah well i, I know you it. saw that i know it's sci-fi philip k dick of course you saw the yeah, damn, that's all right. damn movie, but interesting. this here was it was it was all right so not yeah. really kill myself to see um, so this is yet another co-production between Blumhouse Tilt and WWE Studios. The last time I saw their collaboration on film was Slight, which I reviewed um, a few months ago. And I actually enjoyed, you know, yeah. uh, for being a kind of indie, low-key, you know, attempt at sci-fi. So this one here um, pretty much is centered on... A particular moment in Bruce Lee's career, or at least before he actually be became popular worldwide, um, which pretty much set his path in terms of him being this iconic, um, you know, hero within the martial arts world. Now. And yeah. pretty much it's, it, it involves, uh, well, at the moment, Bruce Lee, this is before he even um, created Jeet Kune Do. Um, he's teaching Kung Fu at um, San Francisco's Chinatown, right? So um, he's teaching like you know the common you know common people or well, mainly white people basically he's teaching how to fight right, um, and while this is going on there is this one particular um, Tai Chi master well Tai Chi slash Northern Shaolin master in um, this Chinese monastery um, his name is Wang Jack Man so basically he is kind of excommunicated. Um, from the, the monastery. Reason being is because um, there was this exhibition match that opens the film. And right. there was this forbidden move is apparently a kick that he did, uh, that he did, sorry, that, you know, was forbidden and is against the rules. You're not supposed to do that because that could kill your opponent, yada, yada, yada. And, right. you know, that just kind of pisses off the, the elders and they just say, well, you know what? You just need to go and find some enlightenment so you go. Um... And for basically, he he well, right. So Wong goes to the United States because, um, well, basically, with Bruce Lee doing his thing, you know, Bruce, well, basically, the Shaolin uh, Monastery knows about what Bruce Lee is doing. Um, Wong, on the other hand, he's kind of skeptical about it, 
So it's basically like, you know, and you've seen this before in other classic martial arts movies where it's like, well, you know, Kung Fu is ours. We should not share this secret, these secrets with the, the common man, with the rest of the world. Now. This is for us, basically. So he heads to San Francisco now. Well, Wong heads to San Francisco and he seeks to, well, he's pretty, he's pretty much seeking out Bruce Lee. Like, he just wants to see what he's doing. He wants to see exactly what he's up to in terms of yeah. promoting Kung Fu. And Bruce Lee, um, or the way how he's um, he's portrayed in this film here, he is like a real cocky kind of, like a real asshole, basically. He's like real full of himself, though, basically. Like he knows he's his shit. He's like, well, yeah, I, yeah. I got to do acting and all that kind of stuff. You know, I'm going to get my big break. And this is before Green Hornet and Kung Fu. Well, you know the, the history behind the Kung Fu TV show, right? I'm guessing. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, where he had the idea of it, but basically, the character, yeah, yeah. yeah, the studio was like, well, Warner Brothers at the time was like, uh, like to have a, 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 a primetime show starring an Asian actor, uh, we're not really feeling that so much. So that's yeah. how David Carradine got to play um, Quan Chan King. You know, yeah. believe it or not, that's, 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 the, that's his story, right? And of course, well, Bruce Lee had to play, um, you know, side uh, second fiddle, sorry, to um, yeah. Green Hornet, you know, when that yeah. that, when that series came out. Um, yeah. So basically, but eventually they run into each other. But how they run into each other is true. Uh, white guy, his name is Steve McKee. At first, I was telling myself, is this supposed to be Steve McQueen? Because right. apparently. In history, um, C. McQueen yeah. um, actually met we'll Bruce Lee and trained under him, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah, we know that, yeah. Yeah. So, C. McKee, sorry, Steve McKee basically is this guy who lives in, San, well, he lives in San Francisco, right? So, he attends the, the, the school where um, where Bruce teaches. He's like one of his prize students, actually. Um, he learns a lot from him, even though, um, you know, I wouldn't say like he's one of the best students, but, you know, he knows his way around Kung Fu and all that stuff. He's a, he's a quick learner, basically. Um, yeah. And then there's this whole side story where he run he where he meets this this uh, really attractive Asian girl, and then we learn that she's a prostitute and she's part of well um, this Chinese triad group who basically control any crime crime in in San Francisco. Well, in China, yeah. I should say brought her down, and now she have to work to pay her debt and all that kind of stuff. So he trying to get her out of that um, out of that imprisonment now. And every once in a while, he'll get, his, he'll get his ass kicked, you know, and all that kind of stuff. Bruce had to kind of come and, you know, put him on course and all that kind of stuff. But then, eventually, he, he um, Steve ended up meeting uh, Wong. And, you know, he learns from Wong that, you know, he wants to meet Bruce. And, he, he you know, he wants to talk to him and perhaps um, confront him, you know, and all that kind of stuff. So, long story short, mm. thanks to Steve, they kind of organize... Well, sorry, the, the, the triad kind of organize this big... Um, tournament, if you will, where they want Bruce because they know they know Bruce, they know what you know, they know his role in the community, right? So they want Bruce to fight Wong and they will bet on it basically. And if Bruce wins, then the Gil, along with the other prostitutes, will be free, right? But okay, if they lose, well, sorry, if Bruce loses, then well, they lose their money and Bruce is defeated. And the girls have to stay with the trial. And that's all I'll say here. So, yeah, going into this film, that's right. So, just based off of what I, I, I just discussed, right? Um, you notice I didn't really mention much about Bruce, right? Yeah. Yeah. And and this is the huge, 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 huge flaw about this movie here. Like, going into this movie, you would expect that, all right, this is about Bruce Lee. This is about the moment where... Or at least how they, they, they pitch it in the in the trailers. This is a controversial fight between Bruce Lee and Wong Jack Man. And right. but reason but reason why it's controversial, this is just a, a minor spoiler, is that because how Bruce was at the start, being really cocky and being arrogant and stuff like that, and because of this fight and the outcome of this fight, this pretty much kinda made him become the the the, 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 the person that we know you know, we know today. He's a lot more focused. He's a lot more humble. Yes, I know he's dead and all, but you know, he was more humble. He was much more focused on, you know, you know, not just martial arts, but really spreading the word about it too, and really, uh, really about enlightenment. There, you know, that was like the last thing that was on Bruce Lee's mind. You know, before this fight took place, there basically. So Wong 
kind of like truly fight itself had to had to steer Bruce on the right course, basically. So that's right. that's what the fight is about now. But you know, there's lots of speculations as to whether this fight took place. Well, people say that it did happen, but the way how the movie shows it here is that yes, yeah, they did fictionalize a lot of stuff, and the director did come out and say that yes, a majority of the stuff was uh, fictionalized here, right? And okay. you know what? Wherever so be it. I just want to see Bruce being Bruce. And major problem here with this movie is Steve, the character of Steve, because yeah. it's almost to the point that hey, are you the protagonist of this film or is it Bruce? Is this Bruce's story or is this Steve's story? Like I'm not saying like so. There's nothing wrong with Bruce's relationship with with Steve. All right, that's fine. But then when you have Steve being this guy who pretty much kicks the story off now, where he runs into the triad and he, you know, you know he falls in love with the prostitute and then he wants to get her out, and then on top of all that, him meeting Wong and pretty much kind of spurring him on to to have him meet Bruce. Knowing full well that Wong kind of wanna wanna kind of kind of want to fight this guy now, you know, basically. So it's like Steve is the one who's pretty much setting things up now, basically, and this Bruce is the guy in the middle, basically. And okay. I don't know. I felt that they were they were and this like I, I actually heard of this in uh, reviews after well after I saw the, the the film actually watched some reviews that this movie here was actually a lot longer. Than it was because okay. right and now this clock's in at about like nine three minutes long, but there was more time dedicated to Steve, and people were like really pissed off by it now. So they cut a lot of stuff out, and you could kind of see it though. Um, yeah, this this story, this film I should say, does not have a lot of focus. It really keeps cutting back from Bruce to Steve, and then Steve to Bruce. You know, yeah. Like I I felt it personally. You could have just taken out Steve altogether. Like why not have Bruce be the fourth at be at the forefront? Isn't it his story? Isn't it about what, how, you know, how his mannerisms or how he changed for the better? So why have this Steve guy in the first place? As a matter of fact, right. why have this whole triad subplot thing? Now, I don't know if this actually happened. I don't know. I'm guessing that they would in, that they would have some bet, you know, some betting involved, I guess. But I don't know why, when you think about it. Why the triad would be involved in a fight between these two martial artists, and I mean, it's not saying like they're the greatest in the world, but you know, yeah. it's just two representatives of kung fu. It's just two different perspectives of it. But why have this bet? Why why bet on a match like that? I don't know. It it just kind of felt weird. Um, but one thing though, well, the setting of the fight itself, by the way, is in a warehouse, right? So it's not like the it's not like a, a big match. It's not like um, you know, Ali versus Foreman or anything like that. Like the whole yeah. world was watching or whatever like that. It's just a small scale thing that pretty much kind of set Bruce Lee on his path of enlightenment. And I, I like that. I think that's a very endearing team now. But I felt like the film itself didn't focus on that. It was just really more about the setup leading up to the fight itself. Um, as for the actor who played um, Bruce, his name is Philip Nig. I think NG, I think that's how you pronounce it. Um, oh yeah, yeah, like Andrew and like yeah, Andrew. And... Yeah, um, right. he, for one thing, the man looked the part, and right. I felt that acting wise, he did bring a lot of charm and energy to the character. Right, well, so he's kind of like yeah. Tupac, Tupac kid. He's yeah, Tupac. yeah, yeah. Whereas right. like, he's doing his best, but you felt it could have been in a better movie. You know what I mean? That's okay, how it right. was. Yeah, right. but when he was yeah. on screen though, I thought that he just like he he just kind of I don't want to say stole the show, but he was just like when he, he just has that presence about him now. I like watching him. I was like, "Yeah, but this is like, you know, Bruce Lee, the our hero, come back there." You know what I mean? But then, of course, you'll have to cut back to Steve and Steve stuff. And I'm not saying that the actor was terrible. I just felt that there was no need for him to be in this story. And I mean, just overall, everybody do do you know? Everybody, they don't. There's no half-assing in terms of acting, right? Even right down to the guy who plays Steve, right? Um, yeah. I, th- I thought that the actor who played um played Wong Jackman was great. Um, apparently he didn't have any background in martial arts though before doing okay. this performances so i was like wow okay he was quite convincing here though, especially in the fight no oh, really? okay. yeah he really was though um the titular fight itself i thought was well handled though um one thing though and this is just a little nitpick with me like i've noticed with you know modern martial arts movies they do like to uh, um, incorporate a lot of a lot of style into their, their um the camera work and you know just the way how they 
how how the how they choreograph the fights there. So for example here with this we have some slow mo shots and you know a little too much of the slow mo I find that was unnecessary. You have some shots that was kinda sped up and stuff like that. You have some little visual right. you know, some little VFX stuff added to it and I was like, well Yeah, but it it's making it more modern and more, you know, like I, I like my old school kick up where it was just like the camera moving and you see the, the performers doing their thing. But then when yeah. you when you add, you know, style, you know, a lot of flair to the visuals, it kinda takes me out of it now personally. It's kinda like you you're really glorifying this thing. You you're making it a little bit more um fantastical than it actually is, you know what I mean? Right. Um so it did kinda take me out a bit, but overall I thought the fight was well handled. Um choreography was great though. And the, the outcome of it, I wouldn't say it was disappointing, um, but it did really hammer in the, the, the point about, you know, Bruce, you know, going on this, pretty much being stood into this part now, this one part of enlightenment that he that he will eventually follow. Um, right. But then it kind of make you wonder, okay, so that was the real reason why you came all this way down to the States for. It wasn't so much about all you having conflicting views about, you know, martial arts and all this yeah. kind of fighting it out in the ring or whatever it is. But it's like no you tell me you 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 had this this um this this idea in your head. Like you came with the sole purpose. Like basically this another minor spoiler. Basically Bruce is supposed to be the one to to help influence Kung Fu, to help introduce it to the 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 Western world basically, right? So you had to travel from the east, even though you were kind of excommunicated, whatever. So you saw it in yourself to come all this way down here to fight this guy and pretty much tell him this is the part that you must follow. You know what I mean? Right. It, it's kind of dumb when you think about it. Now. It kind of don't make any sense, you know? I felt they could have really fleshed out that philosophy a lot better because I get where they're coming from. I understand what they're trying to, to really do here, but the setup, though, was... Yeah, could have been could have been way 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 better, um, and then especially with that whole thing with Steve as well, just didn't work. And finally, before I get into rating, just one slight little spoiler here: there is one fight scene involving Wong and Bruce where they basically have to save Steve from getting his ass kicked from a bunch of triad fellas. And from there, like I was enjoying it, like I was they they do throw in some Bruce Lee worship, like this one little scene where, if you remember from from Anti Dragon, that famous scene where Bruce got those three slices, those three um, slashes, sorry, to his um, to his stomach, and, you know, he licks the blood and he spits it, and then he fights, you know? Right, right, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. You know, when he takes off the shirt, he, uh, he, he licks the wound, he licks, yeah, he licks the wound, spits the blood out, and then he fights. They do that there, and I was like, okay, I, I kind of get, it's, it's Bruce Lee worship, I, I, I get, I get, I, I understand, but, to me, it was like kind of unnecessary though because it's kind of like you tell him, well, okay, now you tell him this fight now is pretty much going to set up the Bruce Lee that we know today, you know? This one right. fight where he have to save this white boy from getting his ass cut is where we got Bruce Lee in his prime now. This is the beginning of him now, you know? It's, it's, it's just like, I, I get the, the idea. I, I get that the, the filmmakers of them were passionate about this project. You could tell. Um, even right now to the really impressive um closing credit sequence where you have bruce in this little you know visual montage here. i thought that was cool but yeah boy um for me i really wanted to like this film though because um i was impressed with um <clears throat> with slight and what um blumhouse lit and wwe films brought um i know it's gonna get that 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 bruce lee worship you know through all the film um it's just in that one fight scene near the end it just kind of came off a little awkward. Like, I, I got what they're trying to do. But it was just kind of awkward, kind of sloppy. But overall, though, I felt that this movie could have been more about Bruce and not about the Steve character. It's almost like, you know, going back to the whole reason why Bruce himself was the star of Kung Fu, you know? It's almost right. like you have to bring in this white character to bring some credibility to your film now, you know what I mean? Even though it's set in the United States and not in China, but still... It's Bruce Lee. He is an icon, you know, an international icon. Why not give this man his own film? 
And yes, I know we had Dragon the Bruce Lee story way back in 93, but that was kind of forgettable. Even though it did give us some great music that they use in a lot of trailers. Check out the yeah. movie, you'll understand what I'm talking about. But yeah, other than that though, it, it kind of just felt like, you know, the same problems resurfacing again where you, you can't even trust this one Asian actor to carry your film. You have to have this unappealing white character to, 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 to you know, to make it to make it feel more cohesive. And, you know, the moments that you were there, admittedly, felt really boring. It just felt like it just dra- It just really dragged the story way too much, though. Now, yeah. on the other hand, though, I do get that what they were trying to do. It's it's not... I would say it's like a noble failure, but, like, there was some heart in it. It wasn't... It didn't feel half-assed to me. It did feel okay. like these characters... Sorry, the, 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 um, the crew and the cast really wanted to, to put their all into it. Really wanted to pay tribute to the icon that is Bruce Lee, but... If they had just focused, if they just had a, a better written story and a bigger focus on Bruce Lee and just taken out Steve altogether, then yeah, yeah we could have had a better movie. But for me at the moment though, uh, I would give this a light 3 out of 5 stars. It was alright. It's one of those shows that it, it's one of those kind of Saturday matinee movies you watch it or Saturday night movies you watch it when you have nothing to do. You'll enjoy it. it the, the fight scenes are handled very well and you know, just seeing Bruce or at least this actor playing Bruce is it's quite fun to see. But yeah, them 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 Steve moments really drug the um really dragged the, the story way too much though. Um yeah. kinda taking those out altogether. Kinda added more you know, more of the conflict now between Wong and Bruce now. Cause that right. at the heart is what the movie is about. And then really really kinda emphasize why this whole direction, this new direction that Bruce Lee undertook is so important in his life instead of kind of arbitrary, like, oh, well, this guy came and he showed me some moves and he almost kicked my ass, so because I need to get my ass kicked, so now I'm gonna, I'm now gonna create my own martial arts style, Jeet Kune Do, you know what I mean? It could have yeah. been much better handled than that, but for me, I didn't hate the show, but this could have been way, way, way better, just simply because of the person or at least the person who is in focus it's bruce lee man come on could have given us a better movie but yeah, yeah for the most part light three out of five stars is not the worst movie i saw there but my god this could have been way 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 better than it than it was but yeah if you have nothing else better to do and you're really curious to see it yeah give it a look okay Taking the chances, you're taking the risks. 